Good morning. Hope you all had a good 4th of July celebrating the, the independence of our nation and the freedoms that we enjoy, the, the joy of this is our, our tribe, our fatherland, the place we call home, the memories we've enjoyed and the landscapes we know so well and just grateful to God for all of His blessings to us. It's a tough time in our nation and it, it needs our prayer. It, it needs our light. It needs the light of Christ to, to shine into it. It needs, it needs truth. It needs the message from this Bible to be disseminated into our land. And it needs a love like no other, a love that comes from Christ and Christ alone. We need people filled with the Spirit, manifesting the fruits of the Spirit in a land that's in trouble. This world needs the church to be the church more than it's ever been, to be a beacon of light in such darkness. And so I exhort and encourage us to lock shields like never before and draw near to Jesus Christ and to shine His light and His truth. Our nations follow in the pattern of what we learned in Romans 1. This is what happens when you suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness and you're given over to sin and evil and immoralities and injustices. And so the question is, is there hope? Is there hope? Are we to be any different than people who are losing their idols and their hopes and they're falling apart? Well, there isn't hope if your hope is America, if your hope is this world, or if your hope is even in your freedoms. They're going to be dying and you're going to lose them. So what is the hope? Why do we gather this morning? This morning we are going to examine and we're going to look at the glorious truth of our freedom. We live in a country called the land of the free. And most of its citizens live in slavery to sin. They live in bondage while they boast of freedom. And we have a gospel that I'm not ashamed of that can set them free from the bondage of sin and brought back into a relationship with God. And that's what we'll take up this morning. We're going to take up where we left off two weeks ago in Romans 3.24 on the idea of redemption. There's a way to be justified apart from works, apart from the law, and it's through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. This is God's remedy for our slavery. And you say, what, what slavery? Like the Jews said to Jesus when he told them, you guys are slaves. We've never been slaves to anybody. We're children of Abraham. He says, you're slaves to sin. You're under the dominion of sin. You're in slavery while you boast of your freedom. We spent six months looking at Romans 1 through 3 and looking at the slavery where Paul concluded in Romans 3, 9, both Jew and Gentile are under the dominion of sin. Whether you're religious or irreligious, moral or immoral, you are under the dominion of sin of sin, and Paul was very thorough to show you there, there's no way in your humanity or through law, works, or efforts you could ever get out of this bondage. You can't work your way out of this slavery. It'll never happen. You're a slave to sin and to self-righteousness and looking in all the wrong places to try to fix it. You don't have light. You don't understand. You can't climb out. We're a country with addictions on every turn. And that's a country with man's remedy on every turn. To break addictions and slavery, and none of them truly work. You're still slaves as you exchange your, your idol from alcohol to pride, or from pornography to food, from entertainment to the approval of others. There's guilt, shame, and condemnation and the wrath of God Slavery. Are you here this morning or listening and you're just tired of trying to get out of this bondage? Maybe you've come and you're finally acknowledging, I don't have true freedom. I can't get out of this slavery to sin that I live in and I've tried so many things and now I'm going to try religion. This morning is your 4th of July spiritually. To have the blessed freedom of the sons of God, I'm going to declare to you true freedom from the Word of God. 
And I hold out the hope that Peter called a living hope, a hope that will not die when your country starts to fall apart. I hold out to you Jesus Christ, God's remedy and God's redeemer. And then we'll come to the communion table and we're going to remember this redeemer who shed his blood on a cross on our behalf. So let's go to our God and ask his blessing as we do this together. Father, we come before you and we need a people who when the freedoms of this world or our own nationality, they begin to crumble. God, we need a people who, whose hope is in Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need to shine a light of people who aren't falling apart, who aren't full of anxiety, but are full of trust because here we have no lasting city. And we hope for a better resurrection. God, we hope for what you have promised to us in this word for all who have loved the appearing of Jesus Christ. God, by your spirit, make us steadfast. Make us be immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord because Jesus has been raised from the dead. God, I pray, I pray that you would meet us now, that you would open our eyes and minds and hearts to understand redemption. Take it deeper into each one of our hearts and let it be the founding principle, the foundation cornerstone of our entire existence and hope and future. God, meet us here this morning as the people of God, we pray. Amen. Our outline that we're looking at, we're in Romans 3, 21 through 31. We're looking at eight elements of the righteousness that God imparts to the believer. The first point, it's a righteousness that's been revealed. It's a God kind of righteousness. The righteousness that God requires, he gives to us. He, he's revealed it, and he said he reveals it apart from the law. It's not the law gave, and it revealed the righteous character of God and how we're to live. And now there's a new way that he's revealing his righteousness. And he's revealing it to us in his Son, a son. Second point, it's a righteousness then that comes by faith. The most important reality, I don't work to get this. I don't clean myself up to receive this righteousness. I come with an empty hand and I believe what God has done in his son, Jesus Christ. I believe. Thirdly, it's a righteousness necessary for all. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter where you... I love this Christianity because if you were raised by a Satanist or by the, the best homeschooling Christian mom or dad, you both need salvation. And it's the gospel offered to all. There's no distinction. Free grace offered to everyone. Everyone needs it. And it's offered to all. And then fourthly, where we got slowed down a little bit, it's a righteousness that makes us acceptable to God. It's a righteousness that says being justified. Being justified in the passive voice, it's, it's what God does. Justified means to declare the rightness of something or someone. The God of the universe declaring that you're just. You're righteous. You're, you're, you're so righteous that now you can be in his presence. So the righteousness that revealed is sufficient to bring you back into the presence of God and not be consumed, but to delight and love and be in his presence as a child. It's a beautiful gift. After Romans 1 through 3, and we saw our darkness and our depravity and our sin, how could I ever have a rightness declared to me? What's well, got to come from outside of me? It has to be passive. It has to come upon me. And justification is a legal forensic act. Come into the courtroom. It's a declaration by God, not guilty, righteous. And this is a statement as to how God views us. It's the declaration sent forth from the bench of heaven. You're righteous. And we said you're not just pardoned from your sin, but you're invited to the king's table in his presence where you're accepted and you're loved. 
His righteousness is wrapped around you and he declares you, you measure up to specs. You're righteous. You're right in the very presence of God. And that says being in the present tense right now. Right now as we believe. We are declared righteous. You don't spend the rest of your life trying to do good things to get righteous. It starts at the moment you believe. Every believer here this morning is righteous before God. (laughs) It's true of us this very moment who believe. And it can't increase or decrease based on our behavior. And this would change lives dramatically if you would believe that. The the smiles that would overcome your your faces and the joy that that circumstances could never quench because the God of the universe declares me righteous and acceptable before him. Well, how could I get such a salvation? As a gift by his grace. It's given freely by the heart of God and all the doings of God called grace. I will do it all. Grace and truth were realized in Christ Jesus. What what a gospel. Apart from works, faith, freely. Grace is the good that comes to you from a person that owes you nothing. This is what you must believe. The way that you know you get grace is you're amazed at it. When it finally breaks through, You can't get over it. You just marvel at grace. It's the controlling principle of your life. It's not, that's nice, now what's next? I don't deserve it. You just can't get over it. And you lose your merit-based thinking. It finally breaks free of thinking that God loves you based on your performance. And you're finally just free. There's a God who loves me truly and freely in Jesus Christ And it's your song, and it shall be till you die. It gets in your heart, and it overtakes it to where all I want to do now is live for a God like this. Has grace broke in? So many people sitting in the church still legal. Has it finally set in? It's the most overwhelming truth that there is. Can you hear me? Okay. My ears are playing games with me. So this morning, what we're going to take up, two weeks ago, Paul labored hard. And I want you to wrestle with Paul. He wants to show you again and again, it's free. It's a free gift. It's by grace. All of his doing. It's by faith to those who believe. Apart from the law. So the very essence of the gospel, justification free. And as this takes up your heart, when we finally get this and surrender to it is finished and quit trying to add to this work, grace, free grace. But there is more that must be added to the amazing truth of this gospel. And it's one that demands my heart, my soul, my life, my all. So please hear this. Though Paul's labored extensively to show you it cost us nothing. It was the most expensive gift that has ever been purchased in the history of this world. It's the greatest gift ever given. It was more than all the riches of the universe, if that was the demand. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. The cost of our justification, the cost of our salvation, It's infinite in every sense of the word. And that's what I want to take up this morning. And let your hearts marvel at the price that Christ was willing to pay for your salvation. No harder mind can fathom the depths of what God has done for him. And what he truly offers to us in all of its fullness. You just look at it for the rest of your life and all of eternity and you'll never come to the bottom of it. 
But may we spend the rest of our days and all of eternity digging in and deepening in the price of our redemption. Amen? I think I heard a couple. Thanks for singing. I heard some of you were just, it sounds so good to me to hear the saints worshiping again. So come with me to Romans 3, 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption. This word through, dia, it means by the means of or in connection with. (coughs) This is the means by which God can justify us. Justification is not just some statement made by God. It's not just words uttered. Our salvation differs entirely from creation when God said, let there be light, and there was. Salvation takes more than that. God can't just say, I forgive, because he's all love. Because he's a just God, and the soul that sins must die, he's a righteous God who demands perfection, he's a holy God, something else has to happen. All of God's attributes had to be satisfied in order to bring salvation to us. And so I want you to hear this. There's something that God cannot do. He cannot forgive sin without satisfying his justice. God cannot violate his attributes. He couldn't just say, forgiveness. Thank you. But it's through... It indicates an unmistakable manner that it's only by the means of Christ's work that we could have this salvation. All that God has done in Christ is the only way to make salvation possible. And that's why we say Christ is our cornerstone and everything is built on Him. And this is why we can never make too much of Jesus Christ. It is all in and through Him. So get this. God could not justify the ungodly by simply uttering a word of forgiveness. The whole gospel hangs on this word through. And so I can't emphasize it too much. I'll, I'll put it on my tombstone. Lord, I want through on it as well. I want but now, and I want through, because through is the key to the whole gospel. How can God do this? How can God justify guilty sinners? And the word this morning is redemption. There's no other way that he can say forgiveness without redemption. Foundation stone. We need to treasure this word. It not only tells us how we're saved, but it tells us the price. Price to save us. There was a mighty Christ paid for salvation. It isn't just salvation is free. There's a Redeemer who paid the ransom price to bring redemption, and He brings about the redeemed, therefore the redeemed of the Lord. And I just was thinking through the church's hymnody over the years. How many songs relate to this word and just make you want to sing? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise. I just want a thousand tongues to sing about redemption. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. He paid the debt and made me free. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Therefore the redeemed the Lord shall come with singing unto Zion. There's a chorus, there is a Redeemer. William Cowper, ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. That's my theme. I'm going to sing about it and I will sing about it till I die and I'll sing about it after I die. Redemption. It's the theme of my heart, my life, my soul. And so I want this idea of a redeemer to grip us here this morning. I want that to be the truth that you go to the table with. And I want everyone this morning to understand redemption with your minds your heart, and your will, and I I want the whole man taken up with this word, redemption. So let's try to understand redemption, and I'd be a fool not to pray to try to understand the word redemption. 
Father, we come before you, and as the people of God, we hunger to know this word. We want to understand it in our minds, our hearts, our will. We, we want the through, the dia, the redemption which is in Christ Jesus to overwhelm our hearts, and we want to entrust everything to our Redeemer. And so God, will you now take these Greek and Hebrew words and open minds and hearts and lives, and if anyone is in slavery, let this be their emancipation day in Christ Jesus, I do pray. Amen. English word. It's not as common of a word today. You don't hear it every day as in Paul's day. What comes to mind when I think of it, when I was a kid, you bought these knee-high sodas, they were called, grape, orange, I can't remember all the flavors. You had to pay a little extra money, and when you were done, you'd bring the bottle back to the redemption center, and they would redeem it. And they would give you, you know, 25 cents or a dime or whatever you paid for it. When we were kids, we played uh, basketball. Anyone ever played the game horse? Honestly, raise your hand. Oh, sweet. I don't have to describe it very well. It's a, it's a wonderful game where you, you shoot shots, and if you make it, the guy behind you has to make it. And if he misses it, he gets a letter. And every time he gets a letter, you keep moving through the letter's horse. And if you get horse, you lose. You're gone. But on the last shot, when you get an E, if you miss it, you get what's called a redemption shot. I, I, this is my favorite shot. It showed who could handle pressure. But at this point, you get to shoot again. And if you make it, it's a redemption shot. You get to stay in the game. And if you miss it, you're gone. You got to wait till everybody else is finished. That doesn't do much for me for redemption. So we're going to go to the Greek. There's three Greek words for it, and there's two in the Hebrew. <coughs> Let's look together. Agarazzo. It comes from the noun used to describe an open marketplace, which was called the Agora. Agora place where all sorts of things were bought and sold like wine, oil, pottery, silver, horses, or slaves were bought at this market. And the verb is agarazzo, and it meant to buy something in the marketplace, and there was always a price involved in buying it. The term suggests Christ's saving work involves his purchasing us for himself out of this world's marketplace. The other Greek word has something, it's called ex agarazzo. It's the same word except you got ex out in the front. And it, it brought more of the idea to, to buy out of the marketplace. The idea that an object or person purchased might never have to return there again. And so slaves were purchased out of the marketplace by the payment of a price. And so come back to Romans 1 through 3. We were all slaves to sin. Your nature's night and you, you couldn't get out. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, you're stuck. And so here's the, the picture of what Jesus paid the price of our redemption to bring us out of Romans 1 through 3. That's the but now. There's only one way to get out of that predicament. And Jesus came and paid that. The other is from the, the root verb called yo. And, and that meant to loose or to set free. And it referred to taking off one's clothes or armor. And when used of persons, it signified loosening bonds. They, they'd put these braces around your neck, metal, and it would be to release them, to set them free from their slavery or their bondage. And the word progressed to the word we, we know, latrao. And it signified the ransom price paid to release a prisoner. Many of you saw the Beauty and the Beast. Belle's father is in Beauty and the Beast, and she's, he's stuck there, and she has to come and pay a ransom, which was herself. And she goes into slavery, and she paid it, and her dad went free. Latrosis, the word always had to do with freeing a slave by paying for him. And so I quote Wesley. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. Petrao. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The Old Testament background. Coffer. Redemption of a person who apart 
from redemption. This is interesting. They would die. So the example would be, say you had an ox and it gored someone to death. If there was negligence, the owner of the ox could be killed. And little, little would be gained by just another death. So the Old Testament law provided a way if the owner could come to an agreement with the relatives of the dead person, they could pay a ransom price instead of dying. And the price was called a kofer. Carried more the idea of being delivered from death. Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And this is the idea of a redemption price being paid for that soul that should die and being brought out. And then the, the one we're probably most familiar with is Gael. Gael, the, the, to redeem. Goel is the noun where we get the word kinsman, redeemer. In the Jewish law, there was a principle that property should remain within a family. If a Jewish person lost his share of land, there was a solemn obligation and a near relative. He could buy the property back again and that person would be called a kinsman. And if he was willing or able to purchase it, he became the kinsman redeemer. And in some cases, when there was no male heir, the duty of the kinsman was to marry the widow and raise up heirs to keep it in the family. And there were three qualifications to be a kinsman redeemer. You had to be a close relative. You had to be willing to take on the responsibility. And you had to be able to pay in some price. And so you can imagine what a kinsman redeemer meant to one in such distress. And what comes to your mind the minute you think of a kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament? Ruth. And Ruth, there's a famine. And Naomi and her husband and family, they flee to another country to find food and water. And while they're there, Naomi's husband dies. <coughs> Their two sons marry, Orpah and Ruth. And then those sons both die. And the famine in Judah now passes, so Naomi goes back to Bethlehem. And Orpah takes Naomi's advice and stays there among her people and went back to her family. But Ruth insisted on staying. You're my people. You're mine. And she was very poor. And so Ruth was now allowed to glean in the fields, which was a law in Israel. And to glean means she was allowed to follow the workmen as they were harvesting and they, they would drop little bits of grain as they were discarded and they were, it was a, a law where they could pick it up and glean there. And there was a field that belonged to a very affluent rich man named Boaz. And it turns out that he is a close relation to Naomi. And Boaz was very kind to Ruth and he had the workmen be generous to her. <coughs> Ruth asked Boaz then to be the kinsman redeemer. And Boaz was delighted when she brought it up. But he said, there's a kinsman closer than myself, and I need to take it up with him. And he met with them, and, and he didn't want to do it, so Boaz now could be the kinsman redeemer. Boaz bought the land for Naomi. He married Ruth, and he raised up an heir who happened to be the grandfather in the lineage of King David. Beautiful picture of our redeemer. Jesus became our kinsman by incarnation. He took on flesh and he was born in Bethlehem. And he was willing to be our redeemer in John 10. No one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father, a willing redeemer. He's able as well, thirdly, to redeem us. He alone could provide an adequate redemption price required by God by dying. And he married us and he made us joint heirs with him. So good. I want to pull out from our word study. And now I want to look at a redemptive history study to try to bring this all together. And then we'll go to the table and remember the price of our redemption. If Jewish, redemption was a very precious word to the people of God. For them, redeemed was a ransom price paid for a slave. And so what would come to their mind when they heard this term 
<coughs> what their special holiday remembered, the Passover, the Exodus. Redemption was the demonstration of God stretching out his arm, releasing Israel from their captivity to Egypt, from the Egyptians, and they were under harsh slavery that they had been since Joseph had died. And they're suffering, and it's, they're increasing the intensity of the slavery and labor. They're in bondage. There's no way out. They're slaves. They could not free themselves. And in the Exodus, God, for the sake of his covenant, his hessedness, his promise to the fathers, he delivers them from the bondage of their enemies. And God did for them what they could have never done for themselves. And this becomes the foundation stone of this nation. And even in the giving of the law, listen to what God said. He spoke these words in Exodus 20. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here's the law. And the reasons you're to keep it is because I redeemed you from your slavery. Here's your motivation of redemption to drive it. Because the Lord, <coughs> uh, Deuteronomy 7, 8, because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which He swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and He redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh and the king of Egypt. How did He do it? By the blood of a lamb over their doorposts and the wrath of God came and He passed over those houses that had blood shed. Later, as the story unfolds, Israel plays the harlot and takes other lovers than God and has idols and sin. And eventually, they end up a divided kingdom with the northern and southern. In 722 BC, the Assyrians come in and they wipe out the northern kingdom. And 10 tribes, they take them back to interbreed with other conquered people. The land is taken away. The temple is destroyed. Here's the height of divine judgment and they're in slavery again. What did they long for? Redemption. That God would come in His own person and bring them out of exile back in their land to be a people for His own possession. Isaiah 43.1 But now, thus says the Lord, Creator, O Jacob, and He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name and you're mine. I've, I've redeemed you. You're mine. You're my possession. And so as Scripture continues to unfold in history, the theme of redemption heightens and expands. It's not just a nation or the land of blessing, but it's now personalized and internalized those great themes of redemption the personal sin against God, that all have sinned and lack His glory, alienation from God and estrangement, our bondage to sin, our slave master was Satan. We were held captive to do His will and we were under the dominion of sin. We have a greater bondage than nations and humans. We have a bondage to self and sin and destruction until we come into this world. And so I want you to hear this if you've come this morning. This is your real need if you're in bondage. Bondage to sin and Satan and separation from God. You need a personal exile. Away from the favorable presence of God. Guys, this is your real need. We're in bondage to sin and Satan, and we have been exiled, and we, we run from God, and we're, we can't be in his favorable presence. The sword in the garden that turns every direction because God has to punish sin. There's no way back into the garden, into his presence. That's our bondage. That's our greatest need. We're born separated from God, in exile, in the wilderness, a slave to sin, and no human merit or effort will ever be able to break this bondage and this slavery. You don't possess what it takes to get out of this bondage. I want you to hear that so clearly. There's no way out. 
by working? And how long have some of you been laboring under sin's tyranny? And you've been in the church for maybe decades and you're still under the bondage of sin. Are you tired? Weary and heavy laden? Come to me, says the Redeemer, and I'll give you rest for your souls. What is being revealed this morning is our redemption and our Redeemer. Guys, there's something better than a return to land. We're being freed from an earthly slavery. What Jesus came to do was to redeem us from the bondage of sin and the law's demands and the consequences and the devil, therefore, who had power over death, that we could be cast into the eternal lake of fire. He came to set us free. He came to set us free to God that he could be our father. Every redemption has a price. Christ did not come and pay a ransom price. He, he was the ransom price. He gave himself up for us to purchase himself a bride for a people now who could be his own possession. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, his child. And forever I am. So many sit in churches and nod their heads to the gospel in an academic way and sit in the slavery of sin and it's never broke the shackles. You're still in bondage and it's holding you in all your shame and all your guilt and all your condemnation and you just keep trying to be better and the bondage gets tighter. The chains are tighter on you the harder you try. For you, there's a Redeemer, God's own Son, the precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sinners slain. Quit looking to anything else to redeem you. Quit saving up money for your redemption price called works or service. I'm just trying to do all these things so I can pay my ransom and be set free. I'm going to go do missions so I can get God to love me. If I could just change enough of my behavior, that's my ransom price. There's acceptance. If I could break these addictions, just get rid of these addictions, then I could be redeemed. I could get approval in the church. Everybody will think I'm holy. Self-justification. Doing whatever you can to merit God's approval. In all of your bondage and slavery, I hold up to you this morning a Redeemer who's able to save to the uttermost. Our salvation is free, but it cost God everything. The precious blood of his own son was shed on Calvary's tree on our behalf. He paid it all, and I don't need to add anything to it. Paid in full. Because the Redeemer who came into this world and went up on a cross and he was the ransom price and he shed his blood on our behalf so that we could be made righteous in the presence of God. And it's a gift by grace that God wants to give to every empty hand who will look away from all your personal redemption prizes that you're trying to pay this morning and look to the one Redeemer who paid every last cent. You don't have to add 10 cents to his redemption price. Raise him from the dead. It is finished. The salvation is done. And so I want you to receive that this morning, if you never have. And last time I preached, I, I cheated you, and I didn't give you the Spurgeon quote. And I want you just to hear this, because it just captures to me this faith that Paul's wanting for us, that God is wanting for us. He said, faith is something like this. There's a story told of a captain of a man of war whose son, a young lad, was very fond of running up the rigging of the ship. And one time running after a monkey, he ran up the mast till last he got onto the main truck. 
And now the main truck, you're aware, which I wasn't, is like a large round table put on the mast. So when the boy was on the main truck, there was plenty of room for him. But the difficulty was, to use the best explanation I can, that he could not reach the mast that was under the table. He was not tall enough to get down from this main truck. He couldn't reach the mast and so descend. And there he was on the main truck. He managed to get up there somehow or other, but down he could never get. His father saw that and he looked up in horror. What was he to do? In a few moments, his son would fall down and he would be dashed to pieces. He was clinging to the main truck with all his might, but in a little time, he would fall down on the deck and there he would be a mangled corpse. The captain called for a speaking trumpet and he put it to his mouth and shouted, boy, the next time the ship lurches, throw yourself into the sea. It was in truth his only way of escape. He might be picked up then out of the sea, but he could not be rescued if he fell on the deck, he'd be destroyed. The poor boy (coughs) looked down on the sea. It was a long way, and he couldn't bear the idea of throwing himself into that roaring current beneath him. He thought it looked angry and dangerous. How could he cast himself down into it? And so he clung to the main truck with all his might, though there was no doubt that he must soon let go or perish. The father called for a gun and pointing it up at the boy, he said, boy, the next time the ship lurches, throw yourself into the sea or I will shoot you. And he knew his father would keep his word. And the ship lurched on one side and over went the boy, splash into the sea and out went the brawny arms after him. The sailors rescued him and brought him back onto the deck. Spurgeon says, now we, like the boy, are in a position of extraordinary danger, Romans 1 through 3, by nature, which neither you nor I could possibly escape of ourselves. Unfortunately, we've got some good works of our own, like that main struck, and we cling to them so fondly that we'll never give them up. I just keep holding to my goodness. And Christ knows that unless we give him up, we shall be dashed to pieces at last, for that rotten trust will ruin us. You die holding to that, you will be damned. He therefore says, sinner, let go of thy own trust and drop into the sea of my love. That is faith. When the poor sinner lets go his hold and drops down, and so is saved. And the very thing which looks as if it would destroy him is the means of his being saved. I'm praying for the release of those who live in bondage. There's been a Redeemer who has come to pay that price to set you free from the dominion of sin and all that is destroying you and all your religion and all your good works and all the things you're trying to do, 12 steps, anything, it can't fix this. And there's a redeemer, God's own son, who came into the world and he paid the ransom price so that you could be bought out of the the bondage of Romans 1 through 3 and the sin and the law's condemnation and the devil's bondage to do his will. He paid the price so that he could bring you out of that so that you could be the children of God. It's finished. And so I just keep looking at Romans, child of God, and I, I see all this sin that we saw in Romans 1 through 3. And now we're looking at Jesus and all of his work, his perfect righteousness and his death on a cross And I look at it and I just say, how do you get his work? How do you get that? I love what Jesus did. And he says it's a gift, but it's not a little box wrapped up with a bow. It's not a present. It's a person. Here's a a gift of my son. And, And there's a way to be joined to him. 
And when you're joined to him, all the benefits of who he is and what he's done and his sufficiency and his help and his intercession, his wisdom, his righteousness flows from this person. All of Christianity is getting to that person. And you say, how do I get to Jesus? How do I get in a marriage? I need to be married to him to get all the benefits of who he is and what he is for me. And he offers to you a bride the way you come into this marriage is apart from works, but by faith. He offers a marriage to you if you'll bow your knee and forsake all others and have only him and believe in who he is and what he's done. Repent. That is the way to have this salvation. And then as we continue in Romans, we're going to see that sanctification, the way you live this Christian life, is reckoning that you have been purchased. You have been redeemed and you no longer have to live in the bondages and dominion of sin any longer. And so for the people of God to take off your grave clothes like Lazarus and come and live into the fullness of your redemption and what God has purchased for you is where we will move in the book of Romans. And we're going to flesh this out more next week, Lord willing. The only way that God can declare us not guilty was by declaring his son guilty on a cross. And so next week we will look at the ransom price that our Redeemer had to pay, and it was to propitiate the wrath of God. And now uh, together we're going to come to the table, and man, it's been a long time since we've been able to corporately remember the redemption price so that we could be bought back and brought out of that horrible bondage that we all lived in and set free to the children of God. And so what a, what a blessing to look at each other and see each other's faith and hope and to remember Jesus Christ as our hope and our redeemer. And therefore, we are the redeemed. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to hand out the elements. Joel kind of described how we'll do it, and I wasn't paying attention, so I don't really know how we're going to do it, but I, I trust that you guys uh, know how to. So while the ushers begin handing these out, again, this is for believers, these who have put their faith in the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so let's together prepare our hearts and pray, and then we will partake together. Father, we come before you, and I thank you that there is a Redeemer. I thank you that he is a near relative. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. God, what an amazing truth. And God, he was willing. He's the most willing redeemer that there's ever been. He was willing to come and pay the ultimate sacrifice to redeem a bride for himself, for his father's glory. God, and he was able no one else, being fully God and fully man, could have ever paid the redemption price. Perfect righteousness hanging on a tree, the just one for the unjust, that he might be able to bring us to God, to redeem us. God, I thank you for such a glorious gospel, and I pray let hearts be overwhelmed, hurting hearts that have been through a lot these last three months. God, let redemption be bigger than anything they're facing. This is the greatest reality that we face right here is there's a Redeemer and we're going to live with him forever in perfection and where righteousness dwells and there's no more sun but his glory lights it up. God, let us be a people who hope for this, not for paradise in America. God, we hope to dwell with him in the new heavens and the new earth forever. God, fix our hope again. Let it be steadfast. Let it be the driving influence of all that we say, do, and think. And meet us now as a church with the joy of seeing each other's faces again as we partake. I pray that you bless those who still uh, cannot be here. Health reasons and different reasons, God, just be with them now as they remember. Just give them strengthening grace. Lord, the body causes the growth of the body, and we miss each other so much. I pray for them and their weariness and longing for brothers and sisters. Lord, just encourage their hearts this morning. Let their communion uh, just be blessed as they remember 
the Redeemer and what he's done for them. Encourage their hearts, strengthen them, and help them, I pray this morning. In Christ's name, amen.